Welcome, Patrus Ranti, to episode 56 with Finlay Sutton. Now, we've all had these situations with dentures before, right? You're trying to fit the framework, which has just come back from the lab, and it doesn't fit. And you have this heart sink moment, like, oh my God, like, what do I do now, right? So if you've ever been in that situation and you want to know how to fix it, Finlay Sutton, who is a phenomenal dental educator, will answer this question on this podcast for you, as well as so many others, like, what do you do in a deep bite and there's no space for the chrome? Or how about milled crowns and how to incorporate that with your chrome dentures workflow? So uh, stick with this episode to learn all about that with Finlay Sutton. Hello, Patrice Rati. I know I've been teasing you for a while about this episode with a fantastic educator in the field of dentures, which let's face it, I mean, since I was a student, I've always found dentures confusing. I don't do many at the moment. It's just the nature of, I think demographics has a lot to do with how many dentures you make. At the moment, I'm not making loads, but certainly those struggles that I've had with dentures, they never leave you. Even throughout a student, young dentist, dentures are tricky to get your head around. But I'm convinced that in this episode with Finlay Sutton, you'll probably learn more about chrome dentures and partial dentures in this one episode they did at Den School. Just wanted to make an announcement that there'll be another way for you guys to listen to podcasts and get CPD or CE credits because a lot of you are doing it you know when you're driving or when you're multitasking when you're running and you're listening to the podcast and you like to get the CPD. Now at the moment it's on dentine or tubules.com which is phenomenal value and you can get CPD hours which I'm just amazed at the generosity of Drew for letting me host this on Dentine Tubules completely for free. So thank you so much Drew. But some of you wanted an option whereby you didn't have to log on somewhere to answer questions and that may be coming soon as well. Thanks to those who voted on the Protrusive Dental Community. So I'm just going to keep you in the loop with that. I'm going to tell you about the Protrusive Dental Pearl for this episode. Uh, and this pearl is from my good buddy Alan Burke fantastic dentist you may have listened to episode I think it was 37 it was like a, it was a unusual journey with a young dentist and you know he is such a, a caring kind guy you can just tell right and his dentistry is world-class so I check out the Cornish dentist I think the dot Cornish dot dentist Instagram account follow Alan he's such a cool guy and he taught me this uh, little tip on suturing because we had like a little mini uh, sort of zoom session and uh, many of you I think will benefit from this because like when you're placing a suture, let's say you're placing a Vicryl, Rapide, Foro, uh, and you're, you know, closing up a, a you know, the, the socket after an extraction, you're going to be, you've been taught that when you're actually tying the knot, that you take you, the way you pull is that your hand moves away from you. And this will get you out of jail, you know, most times. So, so if you just follow the rule, if you forget anything, you do your, you know, three throws and then two throws backwards, and then you pull, and then your right hand, your dominant hand, goes away from you. And and most of the time, you'll be fine, right? But actually, um, sometimes the way you insert the needle, or the way you approach it, or the type of suture or knot you're doing means that that rule doesn't always apply. So is there a, another way to think about it? And Alan taught me that actually, where you take the first bite and then where you come out of, so the direction you are going in is the direction that you pull. So let me make that even more tangible for you. If you're going from buckle to lingual, so you've just gone into the buckle papilla, okay, you've taken a bite, and now you're gonna go to lingual papilla, you've taken a bite, you've gone from buckle to lingual. Therefore, when you do your three throws forward, okay, and you're gonna pull that suture, you're gonna make sure that your right hand goes towards the lingual, right? So you're gonna pull the, your right hand towards the lingual, and then you do your reverse throws, and then you come towards the buckle, and you'll notice how much of a difference it makes. Now, your first pull, okay, that's to get the tight suture that you need, okay? If your first one is uh, rubbish and it's it's slack and it's, it's it's very loose and you haven't done a very good job, then you can't make up for it in the second one because the second one's just to reinforce the first one. So all the hard work happens in that first tightening, if you like, or a first knot, if you like. So that's my, my pearl for you. Uh, another few things that I learned from the suturing session is that Alan went on this course for suturing, right? Uh, and he asked uh, these guys on this soft tissue course, right, who knows how to suture, right? And everyone was like, yeah, come on, man. We've been qualified 15, 20 years. We know how to suture. Okay, and everyone put their hand up. Yes, we can suture. So one by one, this um, soft tissue course instructor, this dentist, periodontist, wherever he was, he told everyone to come on the stage one by one, okay, and place a simple interrupted suture. Okay, so Alan told me the story. And then they'd place it, and then the instructor would come along, he'd get his little probe and go, flick, and the suture would come, come undone. 
Next, next person. So the next person comes, again, they do their best suture. He'd come along, flick, and the suture comes undone. And it went on and on and on until everyone got a little bit embarrassed and said, you know what? I think we can learn a few things about suturing. So the reason I share that today is no matter how much you think you know about suturing, Sometimes these little micro tips can really take your suturing skills to the next level. So Alan, thanks so much for letting me use that uh, for the Protrusive Dental Pearl today. Do check out his episode, The Young Dentist Journey. If you haven't listened to it already, he's a top guy. Now, I won't uh, babble on anymore. I'm not going to waste any more of your time because Finlay Sutton is about to give you a denture masterclass right now. Uh, but I'd like to know, um, how were you? Because people have been asking for, for you to come on the show uh, for, for a long time now. How was the pandemic for you? How are you doing now? It must be super busy. How are things? Uh, yeah, it was good. Um, well, obviously, the pandemic wasn't great, was it? You know, in terms of the, the world and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's actually opened up a few sort of opportunities, really. I really loved doing um, the... There's, I, I, in fact, did about 20 webinars during lockdown. And... And that was absolutely it was terrific. Loved doing those, um, and I've, I've got really great feedback from them too. And it's just really, really nice just being able to just sit there and just um, you know show people what I'm doing, and also just give back a little bit, you know. So it's um, without um, you know without charging anything. It was just really, really nice doing that. So so that was good. And then also mm -hmm. we got other stuff sorted out with the practice, which I think was really superb. For instance, um, you know, doing video consultations with patients before they come in, um, mm -hmm. which is ace, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is really, really good because like now we can't do consultations without a mask, you know, being sort of basically covered up and it's really difficult to get that human interaction really. Absolutely. So, so doing it over Zoom is ace. And the other thing I'm finding is really good is another piece of software called Loom, L-O-O-M. Yes. I know. I'm familiar with Loom. It's, uh, it's cool. How, how are you using Loom? I'm using it for helping patients to, well, before they actually come in, say if they're coming in for some extractions and an immediate denture fit, then I can actually do their, do their consent form and they show a little picture of me going through the consent form you know talking about what to expect etc and also i think really importantly afterwards it, i can just do a little personalized video for the patient and they can revisit it from time after time you know so as their immediate dentures are settling in and maybe they're discovering certain problems maybe a couple of days down they can watch the video again oh fin finley's pointed that one out so um, it's um, I'm finding that really useful, and I think also they feel um, like we're a bit more. There's a bit more of a person behind the clinician, mm. a bit more human humanity, really, and that. So, so it's actually, it's I, th there's countless opportunities, and also lab communication with Loom is fantastic. You, you know, my ceramist is not on site, so uh -huh. I can just do a whole video for him and show him the mouth and the person and the shade and exactly what I'm wanting. You know, say rest seats or guide surfaces, etc. So that is terrific. That, as well. I, I'm so glad I, I I hit the record button because this is a real gem that you're sharing, is Sue. I, I, in fact, every episode I have a protrusive dental pearl. So I think uh, we're going to share this uh, as 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 Finn's protrusive dental pearl, which is to, to use Loom because previously I've been using Loom as staff training. So for example, uh, nurses sometimes come and go. Uh, and if you record something once as a training video, then nurses can revisit and, and you can have that one video. And sometimes I work in a team, someone who produces my podcast and God forbid he leaves. Um, I've got a training manual on Loom, but I, I, I like how you incorporate dentistry. I didn't think to do that, especially with patients. I mean, wow, the human touch you've added with the consent and the lab communication, uh, and the little points afterwards, that is really a level above. So uh, thank you for opening my eyes to Loom in, in, in that way. That's great. You're welcome, Jazz. Um, listen, Finn, people, uh, the people listening to the podcast uh, have been begging for you to come on the podcast since its inception uh, over two years ago now. Uh, and uh, Dentures has been covered once by um, my uh, ex-tutor, uh, Mark Bishop. Uh, do you know Mark in Sheffield? Yes, I do. In fact, Mark uh, taught me when I was at uh, at Sheffield. He was this was back in like the late nineteen eighties, early nineties, 
and uh-huh. he was just a really young qualified dentist and super keen and he was my favorite tutor Amazing, terrific! Oh, he's going to love hearing that because because Mark's a, a good friend and he he listens and uh, he did an episode on complete dentures uh, and and now I'm so excited and so are the the Petrucerati. So the people who listen to the podcast called the Petrucerati and the other day I posted on Facebook I said hey Finn's coming on the podcast finally um, what do you want to know and so it was it was the Petrucerati that decided they want to know more more about chrome dentures and and specifically I'll give everyone a flavor of the kind of things we're talking about today so that it whets their appetite for the rest the episode we're going to talk about troubleshooting chrome dentures uh, and common errors and issues that we have framework issues not fitting that sort of stuff we're also going to cover a, a specific scenario with a kennedy class 4 these are you know obviously difficult scenarios in any case but it's particularly in a deep bite we want to hear from you how you would man- manage that and that uh, question was sent in from uh, jean marco d'andrea jean hope you hope you're doing well buddy thanks for sending that question in Milled crowns. People want to know about precision uh, attachments. Um, so it'll be interesting to know about your experiences with that. And then something I've never done before and I didn't know was a thing was immediate anterior chrome dentures. So I'll be very interested to to know uh, you know how you how you do those. But before we get into that, there may be a very small number of people who listen to this somewhere in the world who who don't know who you are, Finn. So for those very small number of people, uh, please tell them who you are. And I'm going to say firstly that I'm so glad that you're British because. Wow, I mean, the 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 you are really are, I think, the state of the art in 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 dentistry, in removal prosthetics, which is your the the real passion area. And uh, I've seen you educate at the Bard a few years ago as well. Your lectures are so engaging and funny and and educational. Your your online content, no one has ever. I'm just saying, no one's ever said oh, I went to a Finn lecture and it was a bit boring. Or whatever, you are just full of so many gems, which is why I've been so excited for you to come on. So please introduce yourself, Finn. So um, yeah, I'm I'm actually based up in the northwest of England, and I have um, a practice based in Garstang, which is just I'm not, I live in Lancaster. The practice in Garstang. And I have a referral practice uh, with my wife, Rachel. And Rachel is a specialist orthodontist. Um, and we started the practice in about 2007, and we've we've grown it since then. So we have a really nice referral base. Um, and uh, and we also we've got two other dentists that work at the practice with us. We've got Saeed, who's a specialist in periodontics. That's Saeed Abad, and we've also got Rob Jacobs, who's an endodontist. So there's four of us specialists at the practice there. Sorry, that's my dog barking in the background. At <laughs> that's <home>. that's <laughs> fine. She's welcome. So, hey, she's welcome. <laughs> uh, so uh, so that's that's what we have currently now. I have been really focusing for the past, I would say, 20 years of really in removable pros. Um, I used to do a little bit of fixed as well, you know, as fixed and removable. But around about six years ago, I decided to just take the plunge and just do nothing but removables. Um, and um, But 20 years ago, I, I actually did a master's at Manchester with uh, Fraser McCord in fixed and removable prosthodontics. So I was six years qualified at this point. I'd qualified mm-hmm. in Sheffield in 93 and been in general practice for six years. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I qualified from Sheffield. And then I really found that general practice was unpredictable. There was quite a lot of situations where I'd actually be trying to do something that just wouldn't work for a patient. Mm -hmm. And I would feel really bad about it. The patients would be upset. And it was just a real issue for me, this predictability. So I, I worked in various different practices, did lots of courses with some great um, teachers. One person in particular was Michael Wise, who was Brilliant. really absolutely amazing. And I did his course and those sorts of things, they, they made me realize there's something else, but I didn't actually know how to get from A to B to do to be really good at, at prosthodontics. So that's why I decided to go back and do my uh, master's in pros at, uh, at Sheffield. So, so what I did was I saved up enough money to to actually 
leave work for a year. I moved back in with my mum and dad in Preston, and then I mm. commuted into Manchester and did my masters. And it was really a great turning point for me in my career progression. Well, no one ever talks about those sacrifices that like you had to, you know, move in with your parents again. And, and usually that's what's involved when you when you have to do an Emkland Dent or a master's or, or a program like that after, you know, X number of years. It's a significant investment in time and money. Uh, and, you know, often you hear about uh, people who are, who are married and then suddenly they have to, um, you know, one person has to completely give up their job and move for the training. Uh, and so really, these are the, the things that People, people don't talk about and it's great that you, you mentioned these sacrifice personal sacrifices you have to make to to get to a level that you want to be at that's absolutely true it is and i think that that's really important because i think dentistry is a, it's not an easy job you know for, for many reasons both technically and managing patients etc there's so many facets to it it's a brilliant job there's no doubt but it is difficult. Um, so so I just found that just making that sacrifice is so worth it. I can't believe how privileged or happy and content I am at the age of 49. That's, um, that's my age. I feel really Don't, comfortable. Not at all. Don't believe it. <laughs> but I feel really <laughs> comfortable with... Um, yeah with my, the quality of the work that I'm doing now, I still go to work and have to learn, you know, and I, and I still learn so much all the time. It's just wonderful. But making that sacrifice years ago, like 20 years ago, was just so worth it. And so from that point forward of doing the Masters, and I loved it, actually. I was not very good at prosthodontics at all. I really was. All and, right. And I, that was highlighted by Fraser, you know, when I actually started <laughs> So he was pretty forthright about that. But um, but that was something that was, you know, I really needed to know because I was, I did think, I, I thought I knew a lot, but actually I really didn't. And so I had to get my head in the literature, in the papers, and actually start doing it as well. But it was a great thing because it was a protective umbrella in which I could treat patients being supervised and also the other brilliant thing about this was the lab was right next door to the to the clinic the dental mm -hmm. um, so i would go through to the lab with my impressions and that's where i met rowan who i work with now and have done you know ever since so and, and rowan works with me in the practice and has done, done since we set it up like 13 years ago um, he works full time for me and just does some amazing work. I think that's one of the things that I think, if I, another real tip for younger dentists, I think, is mm -hmm. if you really like doing dentures, then what I would do is try and find a technician who's a similar age to yourself, who wants to grow and go on a journey and learn with you. And then over the years, you can both improve together and go on this really fantastic journey and i think that applies to all aspects of dentistry really i mean that's a, that's a great gem right there but another one i don't want to go unnoticed is another a breath of fresh air that you said is that look you, you mentioned your age you said you're 49 and and you're at a point now where you're feeling comfortable but whereas a lot of young dentists i find we feel like we need to know all the answers three five years after qualifying and and i think what you highlighted there is that have some patience because it may be some many years later i mean what when when would you say you reached a point post qualifying that you actually felt okay now i'm approaching my peak in a way if, if that's a fair question so i to be honest jazz i i think I, since i've come back from covid i'm loving my dentistry more than ever and feel that I'm at my peak now and i still haven't reached my peak um mm -hmm. i'm still getting better and i think Potentially, I think particularly with remo removable pros because having a pair of loops is really sufficient for what we need. I don't need a microscope to do dentures really well. But with loops, magnification, I think I can go on until I'm like 70 or 80. <laughs> and still well, I hope you certainly do. That your patients will need you. I, I don't think I'm at my peak yet at all, Jazz. I think there's more to come. Um, that is exciting and scary, and and for us mere mortals, that actually things like how, how could you not be? Because you know, I, I subscribe to your newsletter. I, I see all these amazing, sensational cases that you post, and it's just wow. I mean, I just have to say, you really do make. You have made 
removal prosthetics sexy again. And, and I think that, uh, you know, you must have heard that millions of times. Uh, so that's great. So we're going to dive into some of the, 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 the key questions. So troubleshooting chrome dentures. OK, so let's talk about that one particular scenario. Let's say um, and please do add in the context, contextualize everything. Take the you know, feel free to take things a few steps backwards if it will help students to to learn a bit more. But the situation where you get to a Chrome framework try and stage and A, do you always do that? Uh, do you always do that? Do you sometimes skip it? Tell us about the, the background. But what if you are at that appointment and the Chrome framework doesn't fit? How do you ha what's the protocol in terms of managing that situation? So interestingly, Jazz, I I had my I had a patient in yesterday, and it was the first Chrome that hasn't fitted for three years, uh, uh -huh. and it was a lady yesterday. And you know what? The reason it didn't fit, it was a it was a lovely, it was a lower denture. She's got lower anterior teeth, so she's got lower three to three, and then she had this molar right at the back, like a seven. So. So this is, and I put a ring on that molar as part of the framework. So it has a ring rest on it and it seated beautifully on the anterior teeth, but it didn't fit on the ring at all. You know what? Mm -hmm. When I did the impression, I took the impression out of the mouth and the that back tooth had a crown on that had a bit of an undercut on and it, it just pulled the impression out of the tray. And I thought, oh... I can just push it back in and uh -huh. it'll be fine. And I pushed it back in and it looked fine, but it wasn't. And so that molar was in a different position, you know, on the cast compared to mm -hmm. the mouth. So, but anyway, that's the first time in many years. But what I, I think there's two aspects to this. There's two reasons to this. There's, there's technical faults and there are clinical faults really, in terms of why things don't fit. But I think if we go right back to dental school, what I, I was always taught was, um, or felt, I, didn't, I wasn't taught this, but I had this in my mind, that whenever you take anything out of the box, it should fit in the patient's mouth without any adjustment at all. It should just go in and just be perfect. And, mm -hmm. But that is not the case with dentures. Because the mouth and the cast are always different in some way. But there are ways to adjust a denture to make it fit beautifully without causing gaps between the tooth and the denture itself. You know, those mm -hmm. ugly gaps, if you think about it, you know, you've... You have an acrylic denture and you've adjusted it. And then you've got all these horrible gaps between the tooth and the mm -hmm. denture. Premolars, you remove the collets where it's been too tight. And then suddenly, oh. uh, yeah, these horrible gaps, uh, they, they haunt me every night. So, I mean, uh, uh, if you could share some tangible tips to, 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 to make us better with that, wow, that'd be amazing. Okay. It, the collet, the edge, it, there's the key where it touches the tooth. That point where you see it on the model and it's fitting on the model beautifully with that collar and the tooth there, the, the secret is do not touch the top of the collar where it touches the tooth. Don't drill that bit. Drill underneath it. Anywhere underneath, you won't have this gap. And mm -hmm. the secret is using occlude spray. You know, mm -hmm. and is there a specific uh, type of for, for, that's better for removal pros, or is it? I believe it's the, it's the green uh, spray, isn't it? It's the green, it green powder. It's the green mm -hmm. powder, and you can get it from Kent Express and Dental Directory. No problem. It's called Occlude, and it's a mm -hmm. little can with a spray, and you, I spray it onto all of the surfaces. And this this is either with a chrome or with an acrylic based denture when we're coming to fit it. So where it touches the tooth, spray on there. Take that to the mouth, and then try and seat it in the best way possible beforehand though jazz what we need to do is i always check how the denture fits on and off the cast and if i'm unsure i don't speak with rowan about it so i would pick up the phone and talk to the technician about it say look hey i don't know how to get this on and off 
properly. And they are so expert because they're constantly doing it from when they're making it. So we've got to use that same path of insertion on the model as in the mouth. So once you've got like a, a feel for it and a mental picture of how which side goes down first, then you take it to the mouth and you try to do that in the mouth with it. Mm-hmm. With the patient lying back, you can see what you're doing. Patient there, wiggle it in just gently until it won't go any further. But don't really mm. force it. Take it out. And because we've put the occlude spray on, that powder, wherever it touches the tooth, it'll rub off on those bits. And then I take a I mean, just, just to clarify, Finn, yeah, uh, the, the occlude spray goes on the tooth and, and not on the framework and not on the denture, right? It goes on the tooth and it's a denture that picks no. up the occlude spray. Have I got that right? Or have I got it wrong? No, it's, it's the other way around, sure. Jazz. Spray mm. onto the fitting surfaces where the denture will fit against the teeth. Mm. And do mm. it all, doing all of those uniformly there. And then when so you, what you're looking for then is show through of the pink or the silver. That is yeah. the area that is the, the, the problem area. Absolutely. It is. And then you just gently grind that away. Just using any, a, any specific burr like for, for Chrome. Is there any specific burr we should be using? I use it. It's just it's like it's a chamfer crown prep diamond burr, a coarse one. And it's mm-hmm. perfect. In a, I use it in a speed increasing handpiece, just at, next to the patient, and then just shave that off there. But avoid the top of the collet. Mm-hmm. Do not touch the top of the collet. And then, so do that, adjust it, and then spray again onto all of those fitting surfaces back into the mouth and redo it. And just keep redoing that time after time until it fully seats down and it can be sometimes with these complex chromes and if you think imagine a patient who's got like tooth space tooth space Mm -hmm. rowan calls them christmas tree dentures (laughs) (laughs) so there's lots of fitting surfaces that Uh and those take a long time to fit you know, sometimes they can take an hour, a full hour, for the chrome to fit absolutely perfectly. So an so, hour of this uh, repetition sequence of uh, occlude spray, you think? Yes, yeah. And it is. I know that sounds like a long time. And also the other thing is, when you try it in, if you have sitting there and I think, gosh, this is a long way off, and it's not seating anywhere close, don't lose hope. It's sometimes just two or three little touches and then suddenly it starts to drop in and starts to get closer. So it's... Because um, I've been in that situation before and you start panicking, you're thinking, hey, do I need to let's like, you know, abandon ship and just take a new impression? Because automatically you think, hey, uh, it's the impression that's at fault. But I'm so glad you're saying this because us mere mortals, uh, it gives us so much hope. And, and I think that will hopefully encourage dentists to to go about it judiciously meticulously and in the way that in the protocol that you set out with the occlude and, and not lose hope and it can take up to an hour in in those more challenging christmas tree type situations so i, I appreciate i think we all appreciate hearing it from you absolutely so so that's really good and what i do is i think it's all about we've got to manage the patients as well in these situations so what i'll say to the patient is at the beginning of the appointment look i'm going to try this chrome framework in here um, sometimes it takes quite a long time to do this. It might, t- and I might need to keep putting it in and out, in and out to adjust it. So there's nothing wrong with that. That is totally normal because we've got a plaster model, which is which is going to be different than your mouth. So I just try and put the patient's mind at rest because if I didn't say that to them, and I have done, you know, in the past, they'd be like, "Is everything okay?" Is it fitting all right? You know, so it just allays and manages their expectations straight away. 
amazing. So a lot of dentists will listen to this thing, thinking, oh my goodness, I'm, it's not me. It, this happens to other people and uh, it's a great way to do it. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have any clue spray, but I, you know, it's the first thing I'm, I'm going to be getting now. So uh, I, I, before, I'll be honest with you, before it's a bit of a lot of guesswork involved uh, and it, 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 it's going to be very painful. So I think that with that protocol, uh, that's a real gem right there. Um, the next question is Kennedy class four situations in a deep bite. So you can maybe uh, talk about framework design in generally um, good practices in Kennedy class four situations, but then anything specific we can do in these deep bite situations that Jan Marco has specifically asked about. Okay, that's a really great question is this. So, uh, you know, the Kennedy class uh, four is where a patient has upper or lower anterior teeth missing. So they've got all their posterior teeth are still remaining, but they've got this big saddle anteriorly. So and oft, often in like class two, division two cases, they can quite often have a really deep overbite. And sometimes the, the bite is such that the teeth have over erupted and slid past each other and they're actually occluding onto the palate. So, and that can really be a problem for trauma and things. So quite often I, I'm presented with these patients where the upper teeth, say, are unrestorable and they need to come out. So mm -hmm. once we've gone through all the options of different approaches, if we're going for a denture for that patient, then the immediate denture will and and I this is where I don't do and this is answering another question about immediate chrome partial dentures. I don't do them, Jazz, but mm -hmm. I'll talk about that later. But in these cases I like to do an immediate first in acrylic. But often I've got to jack them open at the front mm. because there's no space for acrylic for them. Because they're, if we just fitted it at the intercuspal position, then we'd have no space whatsoever for a clip. In fact, it'd be way for thin. So I do open them up on that at the front there. But with the passage of time and recession, and sorry, resorption and remodeling of the ridge, the space is created for the denture there. So, and then we can. So, actually... so you, you get the posterior uh, settling. It's sort of like a, almost like a dial effect, if you like, but in a, in a completely different mechanism. So you're saying that when you jack them open and you leave them sort of heavy on their lower anteriors, if we're, for example, in a class two, div two, replacing their upper incisors, uh, due to resorption, everything will just settle into place via the acrylic immediate denture. And then, uh, firstly, am I right in saying saying that? Yes, absolutely, you are. And then, how thick? If you get, if you did get a, a, a once and gauge and measure the thickness of the acrylic that you have, opposing the lower incisors in, in that situation, how thick should it be to a that you're not being ridiculous and jacking them up too much, but b sure. have enough to respect the material? Absolutely, I think that we really need two millimeters, two millimeters thickness. Any less than that, it's prone to breaking. However, I do break these rules as well. So, so for instance, just before lockdown, I saw a patient for the, this particular procedure and she'd got a really deep scissor, scissor bite. And we made her it probably around about 0.5 of a millimeter thick, this one. In acrylic. In acrylic. But I relined it really quickly, as in mm -hmm, mm -hmm. literally about a month later, you know, a mm -hmm. month later, I did a lab reline on the base. So where we've got a little bit of shrinkage, a little bit of... So it's like thinking about, I know it's going to break. I'm going to plan to get it relined quicker to thicken it up. But to, but if I was going to put two mil there for that particular patient, it would really have just been just too much. But ideally, mm -hmm. we need two millimetres. Um, so, well, the um, two immediate questions I have, Finn, if you don't mind, two immediate questions I have on that, which uh, would be: A, can you? Uh, is it a good idea in those cases to ask for high impact acrylic? Because something I've just gotten used to sometimes is writing that in the lab sheet. But A, does that does that actually make any difference? So, high impact acrylic, and B, how about incorporating a metal mesh? 
uh, inside. Are, are any of the, these two good ideas or pointless uh, lab fees that uh, you know for, is not really necessary for an immediate in those situations? Um, I think the uh, in fact it's a really good question that jazz about the metal mesh. But I'll answer the high impact acrylic question first. Definitely yes, I do think it's worth having high impact acrylic. They are more resistant to to flexing. That's the good thing about them that the more the less uh, rigid, if you will. So so it, it just they are more robust than uh, standard acrylics. The metal mesh is, I think it's a bit. We, I, I don't do it. I, I just think it's a little bit pointless, but I can't really give you really good scientific facts. It, they do <laughs> tend to just chip and break. And yeah, unless it's substantial, it's just not worth it. Um, but that's, I know that I'm not really answering your question particularly no, well. No, you're, you're right. It's just, it's interesting to know, you know, if you, if you are not routinely using uh, metal mesh, then I, we, we appreciate that and we can, we can learn from your clinical experiences. So what you've talked about already in terms of that situation, we had to reline relatively quickly. That's a great way to manage it. The other way of just allowing things to settle uh, and, and, and leaving it um, high, if you like, or proud and letting things settle rather than, committing yourself to a you know treating an entire arch with restorations for example uh, or um i don't know if you've ever, ha ever had to do any enameloplasty of the uh, opposing incisors just to get them leveled up and that gives you maybe half a mil more space is that something that you ever had to do absolutely jazz that's brilliant that's great so for instance that patient i was just talking about just before lockdown she had one of her canines was like really high the lower one and was definitely and it was really spiky looking and didn't look very nice but and it was really close so i just had a chat with her and said should we just sand that down there it'll look nicer just doing that and and she was perfectly happy and that just created some space for me and, and helps rather than me having to adjust the denture i could adjust the tooth it's just it, yeah absolutely so that's a great little tip I think the deep overbite is is really important. So Jan Marco, uh, it, the well, once we come further forward down, once the resorption's happened, then I do like to then go on to the. It, I always go on to a definitive denture, which will be a metal based one. So, so in those circumstances, I normally will restore that patient to their intercuspal position, you know, because we've got lots of space now. We've got plenty of room to actually fit the denture into the existing bite. So that's fine. Um, occasionally, Though, and this is like sort of feeding into your. I know your passion is occlusion, and um, and you love you know talking about splints and 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 this type of area. And I dentures, partial dentures can be amazing splints too. So so for instance, in these deep overbite cases, mm -hmm. um, these class Kennedy class uh, four, if they've got a really heavily restored posterior dentition. Rather than doing it in intercuspal, we can actually put chrome overlays on all of the back teeth and the whole thing becomes a denture slash splint. And it's protecting the occlusion beautifully as well. So, so that's that, a really... That's amazing. Yeah. I've done one of those in, in, as a dental cord trainee in hostel, but you need a very... Um, understanding or a particular accept, particularly accepting patient because some patients are, are so worried about metal show so to have uh, all these uh, sort of occlusal tables overlaid uh, with metal uh, it, 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 you know it goes in hand with having the relevant consent with that patient and be, them being okay with that right that is so true absolutely and it only works in certain cases where some patients really hide the lingual sorry the palatal surfaces of their teeth so they don't really show very much of that. So, so if we can build the palatal surfaces, or and we leave the buckle edges free, so it's just palatally positioned. Quite often, that metalwork is quite hidden, but it is still that's still the area the patient is going to bite on. So, so they can be quite cool. But you're dead right about that. And 
the, I, what I think is really, really good with Chromes, and this is digressing slightly, is prior to making the Chrome framework, what I like to do is get a pattern resin framework made, which is just the same shape as the Chrome. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's literally like a mock-up of where the metal the metal framework. We can then try that in the patient's mouth. I can assess the accuracy of my working cast because if that fits well, I know that the chrome is probably going to. That's number one. Number mm -hmm. two, I can check the occlusion. If we're gonna do if it's like a splint, I can check that the occlusion is perfect on that acrylic, on the Duralay, you know, on the pattern resin. And also the other really important thing is patients can have a look in the mirror and I can show them where it's bright red. That's going mm. to be in metal. Are you okay about that? And that's really good. That is, that is really brilliant. And so, but you do that for, for all chrome cases? You have this uh, appointment where you try in the pattern uh, resin, the, the Duralay, for example? Yes, I do. And, and I will often incorporate that Duralay pattern with, say, wax blocks if I'm going to record the occlusion mm -hmm. or as a try-in with teeth on as well that's really clever that's really clever now uh, here's just me thinking out loud is that pattern resin is it i mean your your technician rowan would he then use that pattern resin uh, as the lost wax is that possible to use it that as a lost wax technique to then so then if you do all the adjustments on that then the, the chrome will definitely fit or, or not no completely different no, that's it, it's not technically possible to do it like that mm -hmm. it's better to mm -hmm. just use that as a really great sort of guide for the chrome technician to do the waxing up so yeah we don't use that as that that thing sure. but it's a good idea i thought that originally i thought rowan we can uh -huh. do it like that but no we can't so they couldn't do it okay. like that yeah cool good 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 to know good to know in fact we're digressing a little bit but i literally had a patient the other day uh, a routine patient examination he's got a, a chrome denture with upper teeth now he's parafunctional and he wears his denture at night because he's embarrassed to go to bed uh you know with, with his wife with you know missing front teeth so he he wears his denture every night uh, and he's parafunctioning and i'm worried that he's going to start chipping breaking breaking his denture but also there's cracks in his posterior teeth wear facets have you ever had to make a, a splint incorporating a denture because that's pretty much the, the the road we're going to be going down soon absolutely yeah definitely i do that regularly so he would be an ideal case for having a, a you know metal occlusal surfaces if he if he's accepting of that i mean uh, um, keeping his existing denture i mean and actually making a, uh, a removable splint to go on top of his removable denture why not uh, how many teeth has he got natural teeth remaining jazz he is almost similar similar to a Kennedy class four. Maybe he's got uh, uh, you know four anterior teeth. Uh, so he's got plenty of molars and premolars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, you could do that without a doubt. Yeah, do, you could mm. do a splint over the top of the denture, or you could do a splint with some teeth on at the front. Yeah, that's a, that's also a good idea. So that, yeah, that's a, so then he will be less embarrassed uh, to, to go to sleep, you know, uh, with, with his wife. But then also, yeah, there are some teeth that I didn't even think about that. So there we are Learn, learning from you as always. Fantastic. Very good. Thanks for uh, covering that extra bonus question as well. Uh, the next one is, I'm going to come to this one uh, last because it's such a huge topic and I have so much to learn uh, about this to be honest with you. But you mentioned you don't do uh, immediate anterior chrome dentures, nor do I, because I always thought that to go for the effort and expense uh, and, uh, you know, all that resorption that's going to happen uh, for a chrome immediately. It's not something I do, but one of the questions was, uh, uh, you know, how do you manage a situation? So could you give uh, some general advice about the complexities of doing anterior chrome work in an immediate fashion? Yeah, yeah. The reason that we have lots of different steps in, in dentistry, in like prosthetics, so you do your primary in, you do your definitives, and then you do a try in, you know, your jaw reg, you try in, and then et cetera. All of those steps mean that if there's a problem, we can always go back one. And so that each step is done correctly. So if you visualize we've got a patient there and I want to do an immediate chrome and they have 
the upper four anterior teeth are going to be taken out and then we're going to fit an immediate chrome. I've got to make sure that that chrome fits perfectly when I've taken the teeth out and that the you know the flange everything all the whole lot is fitting perfectly so and we often have to have a little bit of metal framework that's going to come be over where the teeth came out there's often space issues you know like over erupted teeth and we want to have more space created uh there's, there's just so many variables that if I ca when I extract if I came to extract the teeth and fit this chrome denture immediately, I'd have so much going on in my head trying to make it work and adjusting the fit, doing all of my occludes, getting the chrome to fit and make and extracting the teeth, managing the patient, managing all of the everything. A aesthetics, phonetics, uh, it's, it's all a, a bit of a, a, a risk there. It's exactly why I never thought to do it. But I think to contextualize the question, if I was to contextualize the question, I think with the first part of it, or when you talked about the candy class four situation, I think you've alleviated some concerns. So I think the rationale for doing anterior immediate chrome work was for patients who are likely to break the acrylic denture because of yeah. their, their deep bite, for example. But I think you've covered it very well there that actually you can leave them open a bit or you can reline them immediately. So I think you've hit two birds with one stone there. Spot on. You're dead right, Jazz, with that. because So that's what I do. And if I feel that the patient needs to go to the chrome quicker then normally I'd like to leave them for like nine to 12 months. So we get, you know, maximum shrinkage there. But in some circumstances, I go quicker. You know, we'll do the, we'll do the immediate first. And then once literally like one or two months down the line, we'll start the chrome and we'll get the chrome done. And then I will reline it at 12 months. So I'll reline that denture and I can do it really neatly, beautifully, the relining of that saddle. So, and I love using zinc oxide, eugenol, in the mm -hmm. saddle area itself. And that just really, it just flows beautifully into where we've got resorption. And then I'll do a pickup impression over the top in alginate there. And then Rowan can just reline that saddle, you know, beautifully for me. And it's just like spot on. So you could, you, theoretically, you could just get on with making your chrome straight away after extracting the teeth. You could like a week later, you could start it. And I think that's a, a more sort of predictable way of doing it, really. That makes a, a lot of sense with the relining as well. And I was smiling there because uh, that's something that Mark Bishop drummed into me. He, he's a huge lover of zinc, ox zinc oxide, you know, so you can tell that he's had the influence in you. Maybe that was his influence, maybe it wasn't. But uh, I can tell you from, from being taught by Mark, he absolutely loves uh, ZOE. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so uh, last big question it is a big one, right? Because I have I have zero experience of this, but it's something I, I want to learn more. Uh, and I'm so glad I've had you on to, to talk about this. So this is milled crowns so for example the other day uh i, I made a, a you know fixed pros case i replaced um mobile and upper anterior teeth but the threes are solid with a uh, fix fix you know six unit bridge uh, uh but if i was to now because he's got really mobile posterior teeth and i know that he's gonna need a denture in the future so be clever once all the healing has happened to make these milled crowns so that a future chrome work can can slot into it but I have no idea, um, I haven't got the knowledge or the experience yet to be able to, to plan that. So if, if any advice you can do about uh, give us about getting started with milled crowns and some considerations and also precision attachments. So if you can maybe explain for the younger dentist what those are and, and how much of your day-to-day -day work uh, involves precision attachments and, and, and milled crowns. Right, okay. Yeah, so I, I do use them. I use both milled crowns i don't i don't actually call they're not true milled crowns they're they're crowns that have guide surfaces on they've got rest seats on and they're, they're nicely shaped to accept the denture but a, a true milled crown is where you've got this precision milled um shelves really with little slots and things in the crowns themselves now i don't use those because 
they are quite maintenance heavy and they they are quite prone to failure as well this is the issue so i try to keep things as simple as possible and avoid using attachments if at all possible the situations that I do use them are, and I generally use Rhine stud attachments. So r what a Rhine is, a Rhine stud is like, a, it's a little post, a post that will go into the root canal of a tooth, and it has a stud that sticks out of the end of the root canal tooth. Mm -hmm. And then inside the denture is a little fitting, a little bit like a locator attachment for implants so it just fits over that rind stud so if roughly i'll use about two of those a year you know two a year mm -hmm. all i do is dentures so it's not very often but those situations that i use them in you know what i hate clasps i hate the look of them they are that's the only thing about partial dentures that really detracts from the aesthetics because Basically, partial dentures can be way better looking than a bridge or an implant bridge because we've got all this beautiful flange and we can replace all the pink and the white. But say if you have a patient that has a, a canine and then they're distal to that canine, they're edentulous, but mm -hmm. they happen to have a premolar root you know, yep. just behind that canine, and that if they have a high smile line, and this is why looking at the smile line is crucial in prosthodontics, You've got to see how much they show. If they show that canine really all the way up, a clasp is just going to look ugly. It doesn't matter, you know, what colour. Uh, you know, dental D is okay, is a compromise, but... It's still not great. So if we've got a root behind that and we can root fill it, put a stud in there and clip the denture on, then they work really, really well. Um, but the, I am always warn the patient, I really, really manage their expectations because nothing lasts forever. That root will probably split. I'll say to them, look, we we can do this. We can put the stud in the tooth or we can clasp the tooth in front. So we, we can do either or. And I'll go through the pros and cons. And I'll talk about the, the, the post could split the root at some stage. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we will need to add a clasp onto your denture around that canine because you can add clasps into flanges of existing dentures quite easily. So it's just making it future-proof. That's really important. For attachments to work really well, it's crucial that everything is braced properly by the other teeth. We don't want too much talking forces on the attachment because it will cause that attachment to fail quicker. So this is why I love metal backings on the teeth. So... and. Just if you could, vi if you can visualize resin bonded bridges, you know, resin bonded mm -hmm. bridge with those metal backings. I love those. My dentures are like removable resin bonded bridges. So they've got backing after backing after backing hidden away down behind the teeth, but they mm -hmm. touch the teeth in so many areas, this offers great resistance to rotation and it adds rigidity and stability. Mm -hmm. So it's reducing the forces on that attachment to a minimum to help it last as long as possible. That's so, I mean, there's so many benefits to that, like you said, the bracing, the rigidity. So you, you know, you're less likely to get mechanical failure. Uh, you can get a degree of occlusal control as well, because you have so much material uh, to work with. And I, I imagine when you're raising the vertical dimension to have those backings and to, to, to make sure you have coupling of the anterior teeth or whatever, uh, I can definitely see. I, I like your uh, comparison to a resin bond bridge. So, you know, everyone can visualize, uh, you know, the metal backings of a resin bond bridge, but incorporated within the denture. Um, that, that's fantastic. But I, I mean, I know with that question, such a broad question, and there's really impossible to, to delve deep into it. Um, 
you've mentioned that scenario with the high smile line, why that would benefit yeah. from it. Are there any other situations where you think, okay, maybe I will need to pull out these Rhine studs, as you said, or uh, think about um, incorporating retentive features into the crowns? I think, Jazz, your case you're talking about, you, you mentioned about this patient of yours who has upper three to three and then the posteriors are shot. So, and the upper three to three are restored with crowns. If those crowns are not in great condition, then they're ideal for taking off and then replacing with with all these lovely retention features in. So what I would do is if you can visualize um, having really nice crowns on those teeth, but incorporated into the, the, the palatal surfaces, a dimple, a nice big dimple, you know, a big round burr, you, you would, yep. you, would, you know, you get the technician to do it, but if you, it's a big round bird, dimple up into them, plus the guiding, you've got lovely guiding surfaces on the mesial and distal aspects of those crowns too. So all of those features there will help to retain the crown because you'll have your backings that sit into these dimples all the way around the back of those teeth there. Um, and I wouldn't, unless the patient is really wanting to have no clasps, you know, this is really important. If, if the patient didn't want any clasps or a dental D was out of the question, you could put a little slot attachment that sticks out distally from the canines. So that would be incorporated into your crowns. But in those circumstances, what I would do is I would I would link the teeth together, the crowns. So I would have like one, two, three linked, and then one, yep. two, three linked with because the the rotational forces on that bridge, if it was just on the three itself, it would tend to want to pull it off. But I would really. I would. I haven't done anything like this in years, Jazz. So this shows. I what I hate is patients coming back with problems after they spent lots of money. You know, they spend my dentures, a partial denture, something like I'm talking like that. That would be over ten thousand pounds. We'd be looking mm -hmm. at maybe more than that. So if it mm -hmm. all went, you know, if it all fell apart in a few years' time, which these do, um, then it, we're in a real we're in Dickie's Meadow, as we call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so it's really keeping things simple. So ideally, you'd replace the crowns, no slot attachments, and a, a just a simple partial that fits in there with those lovely backings and a nice clasp that comes around either gold or dental D. Well, I think I think what you've um, summarized well is that, hey, everything is possible. These things are possible. Um, and you've mentioned very tangible examples of a slot coming out of a canine using my uh, patient ex as an example. So I appreciate that. But you also beautifully put that keeping things simple for uh, predictability is, is, is so key. And that's the takeaway uh, lesson from that. Um, I guess uh, a couple of questions to make the if someone is going to try this uh, and make it more tangible is a, obviously they need to speak to their technician and make sure they're on board. Uh, B is those dimples. Um, maybe you'll be teaching us suck eggs, but uh, for those younger dentists, those dimples that, that, that also needs to be prepped into the tooth, right? Yep. Yes, it does. And, we need to have a bit of space there for sure. So, I mean, I, I put this case up a cram prep the other day on Instagram, just discussing about material choice. And I, and I said, hey, guess what material I'll be using on this preparation? And then the giveaway was that I'd put this very mechanical slot inside the tooth, which is totally inappropriate for ceramic, right? Uh, and then it, it was the answer was gold. It's a gold cram, but it could easily have been a PFM. But these things, uh, am I right in saying that zirconias, ceramics, it's just not even go there. It has to be metal. Uh, no, I, 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 my technician works beautifully with, with zirconia. Um, and he, the great thing about he, he can match up, I like using Shotlander Enigma teeth, Enigma Life teeth, they're my prosthetic teeth, and he can match up his ceramics to the, the porcelain bonds to zirconia to the, um, uh, to the Enigma Life teeth. So 
And if, like you said, you're absolutely right. Ceramics l don't like sharp edges. They like smooth, round, organic shapes. And when we've got those, there's very little problems in terms of fracturing. So seriously, I've been using PBZs for 13 years, and I've had very, very few problems with any sort of veneering porcelain or stuff breaking off but i so think just to clarify some, that these yeah. pfz's with uh, a for example uh, a rounded organic uh, slot or, or, or a rest, rest slot uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, distally and also would you be doing these uh, dimples uh, flowing dimples into the zirconia framework as well Absolutely, definitely. Brilliant. I, yes. I've definitely learned something because I, I I was too afraid to to go down that route, but it brings me great confidence uh, that that you're that you're using, using zirconias. But I think you have to respect the fact that the, the burrs that you use and the way that you shape the prep it has to be completely different to what we're doing with metal. That's right. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. So the other thing I think, Jazz, that's really important with these backings as well is that they work really really well, but they can. Uh, particularly for upper anteriors, they can create speech issues. So I, I like to do the dimples basically subtractive rests in the upper. So we're keeping that lingual surface not too bulky, you know, because if you imagine we've got a crown, then we've got the denture, you know, the metal framework. So we're keeping mm -hmm. that as thin as possible, the backings, so it doesn't interfere with sibilance and speech. In the lower, if I was to do a crown in the lower jaw, say a lower canine or, or incisor, I would have an additive rest on it. So the rest would actually stick out, almost mm -hmm. like a climbing wall hook. You know those climbing walls that kids love doing? They're just like that, so that the denture can then just sit onto the those, and I incorporate those into the shape of my crowns in that, the lower that, that is that is genius that is genius it's the same uh, analogy as you know i do orthodontics so uh, your upper fixed retainer there's sometimes not enough room for upper fixed retainer but you can always do a lower fixed retainer so in the same vein you can have those dimples coming out of the uh, projecting out of the lingual surface of the lower incisors if i interpret that correctly uh, yeah. uh, and then a lovely analogy about the the, the climbing actually uh, that that's genius um Finn, we're out of time now, but wow, this episode is going to go down in, in protrusive uh, history for sure as being one of the most uh, clinically excellent. Just wow. I was so many gems you, you shared with us there. That's going to immediately improve my denture work and my choice selection. I mean, now I'm going to be uh, speaking to my technician about using monolithic zirconia in, 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 in a ways that, um, that are not so primitive and... Uh, maybe not having to always go for the metal. So you've given me great confidence. You've taught me about the occlude spray uh, and, and, and so many other factors there and communication gems and loom right at the beginning where I, I'm, I thankfully hit the record button, how we can be using video better with patients and with technicians, uh, including the, the way you use loom. So thank you so much for coming on this podcast. I would love to have you on again one day because I can just speak to you forever and ever and ever about this stuff. And I, I know I'm going to be bombarded with messages of like, wow, Finn was awesome, whatnot. And I'll be sure to, to send those to you. But I'm desperate for people because I'm going to get hundreds of messages saying, where can I find out more? So please tell us about where can people learn more from you, Finn, because inevitably they'll want to. Oh, that, thanks, Jazz, very much. If um, just if you just go to my website, it's finlaysutton.co.uk, and it's all about the education part of it there. So you can have a look at the courses that I run, which I run at the practice, which are really good fun, and I love doing them. It's so practical. I get a patient in, and the, all the delegates can watch me treat a patient, and it's lovely, and we do it for immediates, partial dentures, complete dentures, and implant over dentures. But also, I, you know, from talking to you today, I think if there's anybody interested in learning resources as well, if you go to my website and go to the re resources section, click on that, scroll down. There's absolutely loads of really interesting material like papers that I've written and also design help and lots of different patients with with different denture scenarios. So you can have a look at all these different designs and things there. So lots of uh, stuff to look at there. 
I can definitely uh, vouch for that. So I, I, I haven't been on your course for a while. I've got loads of colleagues who have been on, on your courses and they're always, always raving about how much they learn and what a powerful learning experience that you provide. And also as someone who subscribed to your newsletter and getting those cases through, and you're right, actually, sometimes when I've got a specific, because I don't do many dentures as much as I used to, uh, just a different patient base now. Uh, but I know that when I've got one coming up and I think, hey, I bet Finn's got a scenario that he's very generously shared uh, free of charge a lot of time just newsletters wise you've just given out so much value and, and I, quite often I can identify a case and you've given me so many ideas from little things like adding I forgot exactly what the the, the, the benefit of that was on the upper anteriors uh, you add these uh, cingulum rests right? Yes to, to allow the forces to go down the long axis? That's right it just and they they just help they're particularly great in free and saddle dentures they're just brilliant those little composite rests and work beautifully yeah so uh, I'm so glad little... you knew exactly what I was talking about but yeah I mean uh, I could just learn so much from every one of your cases so guys I'll put the link uh, to, to Finn's website uh, on the show notes for, for this episode uh, and uh, I just want to say a massive thank you uh, for answering the questions that were directly from the Petrus uh, Finn thank you so much for giving us the time today it's all right it's absolutely pleasure it's been lovely thanks very much jazz Nice. Brilliant. Thank you so much for listening and watching all the way to the end. If you like that, uh, hit the subscribe button on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube or Dental Tubules. Uh, if you're listening on Apple, please do think about leaving a review. I'd really appreciate that. That's how the podcast grows. Uh, and I look forward to catching you in the next one. The next one's a little bit of an interference cast, and it's about the six or seven signs, I haven't quite decided yet, that you are a comprehensive dentist. Thank you so much, Patrusrati, for joining me once again. 